and you may begin. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. I am incredibly excited to have Jeff Harden here with us um, to give this webinar for us. He is the Raymond E. Keller Professor and Chair of the Department of Integrative Biology at the University of Madison, Wisconsin. He received his BS in Zoology and BA in German at Michigan State University and then got his PhD in biophysics at the University of California at Berkeley. He did his postdoc work at Duke University and then joined the zoology department, which is now the Department of Integrative Biology at the University of Wisconsin in 1991. Uh, I've personally followed uh, Jeff's group as they've been at the forefront of developing tools for digital 4D and two photon microscopy in living embryos. Their current research is focusing on cell-cell adhesion and cell movement in early embryos, and they use C. elegans as a model system. And if you didn't know, Jeff is a recognized educator and textbook author. So some of you may have used The World of the Cell, which is an undergraduate cell biology text that he is an author of. So thank you very much for joining us, Jeff, today. And um, I look forward to watching uh, this webinar. Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Harden. I'm a professor in the Department of Integrated Biology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and it's my privilege to be with you today. What I want to do is to talk a little bit about some of the work that my lab does using the C. elegans embryo as a model system. In particular, I want to talk about a movement called dorsal intercalation that is similar to movements that many animal embryos undergo. Along the way, I'll tell you a little bit about why I'm excited about a new Andor based dragonfly system that we're really looking forward to putting through its paces. More on that in a few minutes. The fundamental interest of my lab is morphogenesis. How do you build an embryo? Clearly building an embryo is complicated. We all started off as a one-celled zygote as you see on the upper left. Some really complicated things happen, and then you get something really complex at the end. This is my son Christopher about 31 years ago or so. Now that embryonic construction project involves cell movement, involves cell adhesion changes, changes in cell signaling that regulate those first two. And many of the pathways that model organism developmental biologists like me have been studying for many years turn out to be misregulated in cancer. So in that sense, cancer is the dark side of development. So the things that we learn here have general relevance to human disease and many other things. Now, one of the bodybuilding movements that cells in early embryos engage in is cell intercalation. It's a key part of the morphogenetic repertoire in animal embryos, and there are two basic kinds of that intercalation. First is radial intercalation. The blue and the orange cells here move between one another, starting off as two rows and then moving orthogonal to their arrangement to create a single layer that is, uh, can cover more surface area. The other kind of intercalation is the one that we'll be talking about, and that's something called convergent extension. In convergent extension, the um, orientation of the rearrangement is different. So we have a group of orange and blue cells again on the right, but now they undergo mediolateral changes in position to make an array of tissue that is narrower in one dimension, but longer in the other dimension. That movement convergent extension is a very common one in tissues that are undergoing explosive elongation. Now, it turns out that I've been studying uh, convergent extension type movements for a really long time, and that goes back to my PhD work with a guy named Ray Keller. In fact, I'm now the Raymond E. Keller Professor of Integrative Biology here at the University of Wisconsin. Just to give you a sense for how long I've been working on this, truth in advertising on the next slide. Yes, this is me on the right um, at uh, Ray Keller's wedding. Ray's in the middle, and then uh, John Gerhardt was officiating. I was the official wedding photographer. And Ray's lab has really 
done some of the most seminal work in um, understanding convergent extension in non-epithelial tissues, in particular during the movements of gastrulation in amphibian embryos. When I was in Ray's lab, I worked on sea urchin gastrulation, a different problem. And in sea urchin gastrulation, a short squat cylinder, the archentron, elongates to span the um, animal vegetal axis of the embryo. And what my PhD work focused on was, in fact, showing that convergent extension occurs during this process. And that's what you see on the right. So that uh, as cells change position, um, they make a tube longer, but also narrower. Now, as I said, Ray's lab has worked on amphibian embryos. And what they've been able to show over the course of many, many years is that rearranging non-epithelial cells, deep cells in amphibian embryos undergo an oriented change in position via convergent extension. And uh, they were able to use explants and microscopy to uh, uh, show that, that, that the cells, uh, as they rearrange, show highly polarized protrusive activity. So uh, an explant that undergoes convergent extensions on the left, and as you see this movie play, you can see just how dramatically elongated this explant gets. And that's because uh, its cells, uh, hundreds of thousands of cells, are undergoing convergent extension. And if one looks at cells in an explant like this, uh, fluorescently labeled cells, you can see that they undergo oriented protrusive activity as the cells are engaging in on the right. So that kind of convergent extension is common in deep or non-epithelial cells. Probably the best studied system for uh, looking at rearrangement of epithelial cells where most of the action is on the apical or exterior surface is the germ band of the Drosophila embryo. So this is a, a really nice movie from Jens Allen's lab um, at Rockefeller. And um, as we run this forward, you will see that cells in the uh, future epidermis of the fly embryo are going to undergo changes in position. Now, as they do this, they form things that are called multicellular rosettes. So let's just run this forward and get the idea. So as cells are changing position, um, they form clusters, and those clusters resolve, and the entire tissue elongates, pushing the tissue off the right edge of the movie in this particular case. So we have deep cells on the one hand in frogs. We have um, uh, epithelial cells driven mostly by the, their apical surfaces in the case of the germ band and Drosophila, but there are other cases that are sort of in the middle, and that's what we want to talk about today. Let me give you a couple of examples, and then we'll talk uh, about my lab's work. One uh, is a, a system studied by Edmund Rowe, University of Chicago. That's the Ascidian notochord primordium. In that case, as you see the blue cells on the left, uh, they undergo convergent extension. But if you look at where the cells are making protrusions, it turns out that they are making protrusions uh, neither at their extreme apical surface or their basal surface, but somewhere in the middle. And the same is true for the, the mammalian neural tube. And Sutherland at University of Virginia has done some really nice work actually filming mouse uh, neural plate morphogenesis. And the same thing is true in that case. These are actually pretty uh, interesting systems. But they're still pretty complicated. And so uh, we've turned to C. elegans as a model organism to try to look at this kind of intermediate level uh, cell rearrangement event in an epithelial sheet. And uh, worms have a number of virtues. You're probably familiar with many of these. They're simple. They've got about 1,000 cells. Uh, they're very reproducible in terms of their development. That uh, allows for pretty refined analysis of development. And that was made possible originally by um, the transparency of these embryos, which makes them great for microscopy. They also have powerful genetics. You can do reverse genetics using RNA-mediated interference, RNAi, a number of other molecular virtues as well. Now, we don't study the adult hermaphrodites. We study the jelly bean-shaped structures that you can see in this worm. Those are embryos. In particular, we study the embryonic epidermis, which I've uh, drawn for you here in a cartoon form. And there are three basic cell types, and we studied uh, each of these cell types at various stages of my lab's work. First, the teal cells undergo an intercalation movement called dorsal intercalation. That's going to be the focus of our talk uh, today. The pink cells undergo a movement called ventral enclosure, 
in which cells migrate to encase the embryo in skin, and then the yellow cells engage in an actomycin-mediated contraction to squeeze the embryo out into a worm shape. So we want to focus on that first teal-colored group of cells. Here's an embryo image using Nemarski microscopy, and then I've colorized four cells to show you how they change position during dorsal intercalation. Anterior is on the left, posterior on the right here, and you can see that these four cells become wedge-shaped. They move between one another in an alternating fashion, so that by the end of this movie, you can see that um, this group of cells, in fact, there's 20 of these cells in total, engage in one round of rearrangement to make a single row of cells across the dorsal midline. So as far as I know, this is the simplest case of a convergent extension type movement. And uh, it's really easy to follow with Nemarski microscopy, which we did initially when we characterized this process. So here you can see a snapshot of uh, embryos from a 4D time-lapse uh, Nemarski series. And I've colorized some of the cells in, in green and blue here. And you can see that uh, initially the cells are not particularly polarized, but they rapidly polarize. They begin to directionally migrate, as you see in the middle. And then by the end, uh, as intercalation is over, you get this characteristic alternating pattern of intercalated cells. Now, we published some work many, many years ago on dorsal intercalation. This was in the old days when... Uh, you couldn't do a lot of sophisticated digital microscopy, but you could do transmission electron microscopy. And so this is a cell that's been serially reconstructed from um, transmission electron micrographs. And the gray here is uh, an epithelial junction, and the red shows the tip of a cell as it's poking its nose under the junctions of a contralateral cell, which you can't see, which would be off the left side of this image. So these cells are interesting. They're hybrid cells, they're epithelial, and yet they also have to be protrusively active. To show that they really are epithelial, the next slide shows uh, a multi-photon uh, movie that I generated many years ago uh, in uh, looking at embryos that are expressing a GFP tag version of a protein called Discs Large, or DLG1, in worms. And uh, the cartoon at the top shows you what, what happens, but let me run this movie forward. And you can see uh, that worms are, are really great for imaging with GFP or other fluorescent, uh, genetically encoded fluorescent tags. And in this case, what you can see is uh, that the cells become wedge-shaped and they make a characteristic ladder-like structure. And by the end of this movie, you can see that some of the, the cell boundaries between dorsal cells actually fry away. That's because these cells make um, multinucleates and cisium later in development. The point here is that we can study intercalation movements at the level of single cells in quite a bit of detail using genetically encoded markers. All right, so that was about the, the turn of the millennium. Um, and then a really great student, at least while Shannon in my lab, um, decided to work on intercalation. And here's the system she was working on. We, we got it in 2004. It's a um, Perkin-Elmer UltraView spinning disk system with a CSU-10 scan head, a, a Hamamatsu Orca 2 ER, and it's now kind of a Franken system. I've cobbled together parts. We control it using Micromanager, um, and we bought a solid state uh, launch, a Vortran laser launch, and it works, still works, believe it or not, but it's pretty primitive by modern standards. Nevertheless, Elise is able to generate really beautiful movies uh, and, and uh, data using the system. And here's an example. So in this case, uh, Elise was following a group of cells, which is expressing a green fluorescent protein tagged protein fragment that binds F-actin. And it's expressed mosaically. So you can see a group of bright cells on one side of the dorsal array moving towards the top of each of the panels. And what you can see, as the green asterisks indicate, is that the cells become polarized, they extend protrusions that look very much like the, the lamellipodia of um, single migrating cells in tissue culture. And eventually, they migrate to the opposite side of the uh, dorsal array. So here's a movie that shows this. And it's really striking 
how protrusively active the cells are, but also how polarized they are as they migrate. And you can see, if you watch carefully at the very beginning of this movie, the back edge, the lateral edges of these cells, are initially protrusively active, but that protrusion becomes dampened very rapidly, and protrusion becomes consolidated in the direction of migration. All right, so uh, Elise made a... Um, Z reconstruction through the thickness of these cells, and that's what you see here. And you can see that the, the nucleus is on the left, and the cells um, in the reconstruction are migrating towards the right, and you can see how thin these protrusions are. And you can see just how um, highly um, oriented they are uh, as, as they migrate. Well, uh, now it's 2020, and a couple of current students in my lab, Yun Zhu and um, Joel Sear, are using a new system that we have in the lab that we're very excited about. But unfortunately, we got stuck in the, the COVID transition, so we really haven't been able to put this system through its paces the way we would like. It's a Dragonfly 500 system, and you can see Joel uh, is sitting there at the system. Uh, and we're pretty excited about this. First of all, it has Borealis correction, so we get flat, beautiful images to the edge of the, um, the, the field of view. Um, we can do fret kinds of uh, imaging with it. We can do a high-low turf with it. Uh, we also have a mosaic DMD-based FRAP photo conversion system. Uh, we're going to use that for Dendro, Dendro 2 imaging as well as FRAP. Uh, and it has a micropoint ablation laser um, uh, as well, so we can do cell ablations. I'll, I'll show you some examples of how we use micropoint lasers to do that kind of uh, experiment later. And one of the things that we're hoping to do is to um, do super resolution via radial fluctuations or surf stream imaging using the system. That's something that the, the Andor systems are well equipped to do. All this is um, integrated with the Fusion software, and that has hooks into Imaris, and so um, we can do deconvolution and, and uh, a number of things that are just really going to float our boat in terms of imaging during dorsal intercalation. So here's one of the early products of that. This is a deconvolved uh, uh, series of images using uh, uh, this Acton reporter system that I showed you previously, generated by Union in the lab. And you can see just the, the, the beautiful images here. And this just simply shows that we can image individual actin filaments inside of cells as they're undergoing dorsal intercalation. So we're very excited about this system. All right, so um, we've got a system that is epithelial and yet engages in polarized protrusive activity. What do we know about it? Well, for uh, over many years, we've been able to make a few kind of preliminary observations. First of all, if you perturb junctional molecules, it's really hard to make a dent in this process. So perturbing junctional proteins has weak effects. So what we've done uh, is to focus on the, what we think is the business end of these cells. And what we know is that these cells make these oriented protrusions that look very much like lamellipodia. So what allows for that local basolateral motility in these epithelial cells? One obvious place to start is with row family GTPases, and you will be familiar with this, that uh, RAC, CDC42, and RO um, regulate the formation of various kinds of arrays of, of actin-based uh, structures. In particular, the RAC family of GTPases regulates things that look a lot like lamellipodia. But CDC42 is involved in, in polarity and in making more slender phyllopodial types of protrusions. You'll also probably be familiar with the fact that the row family GTPases are regulated. Guanine nucleotide exchange factors, or GEFs, um, activate this family of GTPases by um, stimulating them to exchange a bound GDP for a uh, GTP to activate these proteins. And GTPase activating proteins or GAPs inactivate these by stimulating their um, intrinsic enzymatic activity to hydrolyze their bound GTPs. 
Now, this is sort of an obvious set of proteins to go after, but it turned out to be very hard to, to study these proteins at this stage of development, and that's because Rho family GTPases are used throughout development. So perturbing them early in a simple-minded way leads to a, messed, a messy embryo. So we needed a way to perform inducible tissue-specific perturbation of Rho family GTPases. And I don't want to go through the details except to say that we collaborated with Dave Reiner um, at um, uh, the uh, University of uh, at T Texas A&M Health Sciences University, I should say, in Houston. And um, Dave's uh, technology involved an inducible uh, system that makes use of uh, the mRNA surveillance system, the nonsense mediated decay surveillance system in worms called the SMUG system. And I don't want to say too much about it except to say that it works in the following way. At the permissive temperature, lower temperatures, this, this SMUG system, this surveillance system, prevents persistence of engineered mRNAs made from transgenes. So at the um, permissive temperature, um, these mRNAs get um, turned over and destroyed. That's kind of steady state. But if you elevate to the restrictive temperature, the smug system becomes inactivated, and so now these transgenes can persist. So if you have a dominant negative or constitutively activated Rho family GTPase construct, now this will be expressed. And moreover, uh, we use the tissue-specific promoter to drive the smug system so that it's only active in a group of cells. And then by temperature shifting, you can allow these um, molecules to persist at the time that you want. Very powerful system. And Elise Walk Shannon in the lab used it to show that Setan Rack and MIG2, which is the worm uh, member of the Rho G family of rack related proteins, are both involved in dorsal intercalation. So that's what you see here. So across the top is a control embryo that undergoes normal intercalation. You've seen images like that already. In the, the middle section of this figure, um, Elise has expressed using the smug system a constitutively active form of RAC. And this leads to what we call ipsilateral co-migration. In other words, two cells migrating together um, instead of in this alternating pattern. And then uh, expression of a dominant negative uh, rack, uh, set to a dominant negative construct on the bottom, leads to what we call medial delay or contralateral fighting. Cells seem to stall at the midline and jiggle, but they can't really uh, intercalate successfully. So what this shows then is that rack family proteins are required for normal intercalation. So Elise was able to do confocal imaging as well, and so that's what you see here. So uh, the, a set 10 dominant negative um, is expressed along the top, and um, you can see that the cells have trouble making protrusions. They can make very thin protrusions, but the lamellopodial types of protrusions that one normally sees during intercalation are blocked by this loss of function. And the same is true in my two mutants, and the two synergize with one another as well. So uh, RAC and ROG are required for dorsal intercalation, and um, that was a good starting point. So then uh, Elise moved outward to look at possible regulators. And one of the proteins that she landed on after a genome-wide screen of RAC family GEFs was the protein TRIO, which in worms is called ONC73. Uh, TRIO family GEFs have two GEF domains. They have a row-specific GEF, a GEF2 domain, and they have a rack-specific GEF, which is also specific for um, row G, uh, the GEF1 domain. There are mutants available that abrogate the function of either the GEF1 or the GEF2 domain, and that's what um, Elise used to good advantage. She showed that a uh, GEF2 mutant is normal for intercalation but that GEF1 mutants have defects in intercalation that look like the loss of function phenotypes that I showed you on the previous slide. So loss of uh, UNC73's rac -GEF activity leads to the same kinds of blunted protrusions uh, that you've already seen. At least also showed that UNC73 GFP is expressed at the right time uh, in, in intercalating tissues. So UNC73 seems to be activating uh, set 10 rac and MIG2 
rho g. We then capitalize on an observation uh, that John Garika's group at UC Berkeley had made, and that is that they had identified a genetic interactor with UNC73 trio, and that's something called CARMEL. CARMEL stands for capping protein ARP23 and myosin 1 linker. It's quite a mouthful, that's why I'll just say CARMEL the rest of the way. And these are a family of proteins that are highly conserved in eukaryotes. Uh, in metazoans. So uh, the human caramel 1 is on the top, human caramel 2 uh, on the, the bottom. The single caramel homologue called caramel 1 in worms is in the middle. And you can see that the uh, N terminus and the leucine rich regions and, and other features are highly conserved. John's group and then later John Cooper's group at Washington University in St. Louis and tissue culture cells showed that caramel and trio can co immunoprecipitate. And John's group showed that caramel 1 loss of function suppresses loss of function of UNC73 in neurons. So somehow caramel 1 and UNC73 are antagonizing one another. Not entirely clear, more on that in a minute. Caramel proteins are interesting. So uh, as the name implies, they're multifunctional proteins. They're probably scaffolding proteins. But one of the things that they do is that they are capable of binding capping protein. And you may remember from some cell biology course somewhere along the way, the capping proteins bind the barbed or the plus ends of actin filaments, stabilizing them uh, against subunit loss, but also against subunit addition. So in particular, capping proteins uh, stabilize the tips of networks of actin that polymerize uh, via ARP23 mediated branching. That's the blue complex of proteins that forms that Y-shaped structure on the right in this slide. So that's interesting. Uh, so somehow, presumably then, caramels are affecting actin polymerization kinetics or dynamics. Uh, Elise Walk Shannon looked at CARMEL1 mutants and in combination with uh, UNC73 trio mutants during dorsal intercalation. She quantified protrusive activity and the polarity of protrusions. That's what you see in these rose plots here in this diagram. So wild type cells show highly polarized protrusions, mostly pointing straight across the dorsal array to the contralateral side of the embryo. That's what you see on the right. But in caramel 1 loss of function mutants, Elise showed that protrusions form all the way around the periphery. Now, there is still some bias, and the cells can migrate, but uh, they have more difficulty doing so. And what Elise showed was that introducing an UNC73 GEF1 mutant into that caramel 1 mutant background partially rescues or offsets those polarity defects. That's what you see on the right. So actual pictures are on the next slide. You can see these here. Um, caramel 1 mutant is across the top, and then a double mutant with UNC73 and caramel 1 across the bottom. So you look at the top, the yellow arrows point to actin extensions that are in inappropriate locations. So they are being extended on the basal or back sides of these cells. So loss of caramel 1 leads to excess small protrusions all the way around the periphery of these cells. Introducing a trio mutation, UNC73, GEF1 mutant mutation in this background then rescues these effects. So that's what you see across the bottom. You can see that the protrusive activity looks pretty normal um, in the double mutant. So somehow trio and caramel act antagonistically during intercalation. We were really keen to know whether caramel 1 was asymmetrically accumulated in cells because that might be a mechanism by which caramel 1 could act during this process. So Joel Sear in the lab made a CRISPR-based uh, amnion green knock-in for caramel 1, and Anna Hextad imaged that in the brief movie on the next slide. This movie is not particularly interesting, I must say. 
what it shows is the caramel one is present in dorsal cells, but it seems to be ubiquitous. Um, and now we're analyzing this in higher detail. One of the things that got cut short by COVID-19 was our ability to use our new Dragonfly system to image caramel one m neon green at high resolution. But there's no obvious smoking gun here. So the question then is, how might caramel one be working? Well, it's been known for a long time, uh, as I mentioned previously, that capping protein regulates ARP23 networks. One possibility here, uh, as exemplified by this nice diagram from an old paper by Dorothy Schaefer, is that capping protein might uh, stimulate uh, further arborization of ARP23 dependent networks. So on the right side of this image is an, an early um, lamellipodium or phyllopodium as it's beginning to grow. And in that case, there is uh, a lower titer of capping protein. The idea here then is that uh, filaments can grow and this can lead to long filaments in immature um, ARP23 dependent networks. But as these networks become progressively stabilized and capped, that's the red hexagons in the middle in this diagram, um, the idea then is that as more and more filaments become capped, the only place for polymerization of actin to, to occur is via the production of new side branches. So in other words, when capping protein is, is acting, um, uh, this presumably then um, promotes the bushiness of, or arborization of these ARP23 networks. So if caramel is inhibiting capping protein normally, then presumably there's some sort of steady state capping protein level in these cells, and that gives you a normal kind of network that leads to the normal kind of protrusive activity that one sees. But now imagine that we remove caramel through caramel mutation in, in the case of worms, and uh, in this case then, um, the prediction would be that now we lose this antagonism of capping protein, and this somehow leads to excess um, uh, uh, dendritic network. So we get excess bushiness of the ARP23 network. Now, a prediction here uh, is that if you overexpress capping protein, you'll get excess networks as well. So that should phenocopy CARMA1 mutants. So we're going to test that when we can get back in the lab. I have to say that uh, these simple kinds of predictions might not hold true. Bruce Good's lab, in collaboration with the Cooper lab, has shown that there's a really complicated cyclical interaction of multiple proteins, including twin fillin, a protein called V1, um, and uh, caramel proteins that probably is somehow cyclically involved in sequestration and uh, affecting the on-off rate of capping protein at the barbed or plus ends of actin filaments. And there's some specific predictions of the kinds of models that Bruce Good's lab has constructed that we're interested in testing in vivo. All right, so we, we looked at um, guanine nucleotide exchange factors, GEFs, regulating row family GTPases, and we've looked at some genetic interactions uh, there, as I've just talked to you about. But what about the flip side? What about gaps? Well, a candidate gap we were really interested in looking at was one we had already studied in the context of cadherin-dependent cell adhesion, and that's called SRGAP1. SRGAP1 is a single worm family member of a family of proteins that are conserved all the way up to humans called slit robo or SRGAPs. Um, these have an F-bar domain at their uh, end terminus that allows them to interact or possibly shape membranes. They have a gap domain. Uh, and uh, the, the worm SR gap, it turns out, is specific for sed 10 RAC and MIG2 rho G as well as CDC42. And then they have uh, adapter motifs, so at least the vertebrate ones do, at their C terminus. So we identified this in a screen uh, looking for regulators of cadherin-dependent adhesion, but this protein has many interesting properties. Well, they, they get their name because they physically associate with the slit robo complex. These are growth cone guidance proteins, and uh, so they're important for neuronal migration. 
in humans, they lead to a form of um, mental retardation, at least mutations in SRGAP3 do. And they're involved in production of membrane protrusions required for cell migration. And we showed the same is true during morphogenetic events in C. elegans embryos. They also bind to actin regulators via their C terminus. So uh, Bethany Lucas, when she was in the lab, and then more recently Joel Sear has worked on SRGAP1. And uh, SRGAP1 mutants have defects in intercalation. So across the top, you see a wild-type embryo undergoing intercalation on the left. The blue and purple show that the cells are intercalating, as you've seen before. In an SRGAP1 strong loss of function mutant in the middle, you can see that we get the ipsilateral co-migration phenotype. So the two blue cells and two purple cells migrate together. And um, Joel has shown that um, mutations in the slit homologue, slit 1, give a similar phenotype. SRGAP1 GFP uh, is present in the dorsal hypodermis during intercalation. And uh, so all of that suggested to us that an obvious hypothesis, and that is that SRGAP1 is acting as a gap to downregulate RAC dependent motility during intercalation. So Joel used CRISPR to make a gap dead mutant of SRGAP1, and to our surprise, it had no effect on intercalation. So we had thought the model on the left was true, that UNC73 activates SED10 RAC, and SRGAP1 inactivates SED10 RAC. But when Joel made the gap dead mutant, he saw uh, very, very minor defects in intercalation compared to strong loss of function mutants. Moreover, Joel was not able to show a genetic interaction between UNC73 and the GAP-DEAD SRGAP1 uh, mutant. So all of this suggests that, in fact, SRGAP1 is probably not acting as a GAP during this process. That's interesting in a way. So what might it be doing? Well, we think it might be modulating membrane curvature. So here's an M-neon green knock-in for SRGAP1 that Joel made. And you can see that it is dynamically deployed at the edges of cells during dorsal intercalation. And um, we're analyzing the accumulation here, but it sure looks like, um, as cells intercalate, that SRGAP1 accumulates in bright spots at sites where cells are going to undergo neighbor exchange. Here's uh, one of the few images Joel was able to generate on the dragonfly before the COVID-19 lockdown. And um, so this is a deconvolved snapshot of SRGAP1 M-neon green. And you can see that it, it shows up at the cell periphery. And in fact, if you look carefully, it's kind of hard to see perhaps, SRGAP1 seems to show up at the tips of cells as they're migrating contralaterally. So one of the possibilities here that we favor is that SRGAP1 is somehow modulating membrane curvature, which is facilitating neighbor exchange during dorsal intercalation. All right, so we've looked at the apparatus of intercalation. Now let's consider briefly what might polarize protrusions. And as I, I told you, initially, cells make protrusions all the way around the periphery, as you see on the left. But as intercalation really gets going, um, protrusions become highly consolidated towards the leading edge. And we've looked at the machinery now. Uh, what kinds of signals might lead to polarization of this machinery? Well, one of the obvious candidates was CDC42. And so Elise, when she was in the lab, looked at CDC42 function. And what she found using this smug system and, and other genetic tricks to perturb CDC42 function was that loss of function for CDC42 leads to very similar defects to those that you've already seen, in particular, ipsilateral co-migration and um, this medial fighting. So um, across the middle, you see an example of the, the co-migration phenotype. And then on the bottom, cells are uh, have trouble uh, initiating migration. Eventually, they, they do migrate, and, and it leads to ipsilateral defects. So all of this implicated CDC42, perhaps, in polarizing protrusions, which is why you get the co-migration defects. Maybe the, the gun is being aimed inappropriately. Well, CDC42 is known to interact with a protein complex originally discovered in worms called the PAR complex.
and if you perturb par complex components, you get very similar phenotypes. So you get uh, defects that look like CDC42 dependent defects by perturbing PAR3, that's across the middle, or PAR6 across the bottom. So uh, that led us to look to see whether there are um, changes in CDC42 dependent activity at the onset of intercalation. And so we used a CDC42 biosensor um, originally made by Ke Craig Kumpfer, who was in John White's lab. Um, and then um, this was worked on by Elise Walk-Shannon in my lab. So here, here's a movie showing that CDC42 is, is active during intercalation. This is a movie from a former postdoc, Ronan Zeidel Barr. And if you quantify the amount of signal here, that's what you see across the bottom, in normal embryos, CDC42 act CDC42 activity is elevated as cells begin to migrate. So that led uh, Elise to consider what might be upstream that leads to CDC42 activation. She did a genome-wide candidate screen and she honed in on a receptor called VAB1. VAB1 is the uh, single F receptor in C. elegans. So F receptors have an extracellular ligand binding domain, they bind efferin ligands, and then they have a kinase domain intracellularly. And Elise was able to look at um, VAB1 F receptor mutants, particular mutants that abrogate various functions of VAB1. The bottom line is that loss of VAB1 function leads to a very similar co-migration phenotype to what I've already showed you. So Elise then used VAB1 mutants and the CDC42 biosensor to look at CDC42 activity. And what she found was that she got reduction of function of CDC42 activity in VAB1 mutants. So in a way that's a lot clearer, VAB1 acts as a receptor that locally activates CDC42, at least that's the model we're working with. And we're very interested in trying to determine what ligands might be activating VAB1, leading to localized CDC42 activity, leading to polarized protrusions during intercalation. Right now, if you know anything about this literature, you may have been asking through much of what I've just been talking about, well, why didn't they look at the planar cell polarity pathway? The PCP pathway is well known to influence uh, intercalation movements of deep cells in amphibian embryos, for example. That's shown here on this slide from a review article by Cecilia Moen's lab. And John Wallingford and others have shown that uh, the, the PCP family proteins Vangel 2 or Van Gogh, uh, as well as uh, the protein uh, scaffolding molecule Prickle, are involved in intercalation. And in intercalating deep cells, the idea is that localized activity of Vangel and Prickle somehow stabilize medial lateral protrusions that allow cells to intercalate. So you have an array on the left that's going to intercalate into a single row on the right. Problem is that in worms, there just really hasn't been great evidence that there's a true full-on PCP pathway. Worms seem to be derived in this sense, have lost core components of the PCP pathway. We and many other labs have looked at this over a period of years. Uh, however, uh, some components are conserved, including the Vangel homologue, which is called Vang1. And Antonio Colavita's lab showed that Vang1 is required for what appears to be a convergent-like extension movement of ventral neuroblasts in the worm embryo. This is work that was published uh, in collaboration with Zhirong Bao's lab and um, uh, published in Developmental Cell several years ago. That's shown here. So um, uh, Pavak Shah, who was the first author, did really beautiful imaging here, to, and that's what you see on the top. And what you can see is that this group of neuroblasts seems to undergo a convergent extension-like movement. And what this paper shows is that Vang1 and non-muscle myosin, called NMY2, as well as um, the roundabout aeroboreceptor SAX3 are somehow involved in, um, probably locally, in allowing cells to undergo neighbor exchange 
during a ventral neuroblast morphogenesis. So uh, we decided, well, okay, we'll, we'll look at prickle one and vang one, and all I can tell you is that they're, they're probably involved, but we don't know how. So uh, Joel Sear looked at prickle one, and that's what you see here. This is a prickle one mutant. And you can see that one of the yellow cells in this movie actually fails to intercalate completely, gets pushed off the bottom of the movie. And prickle one actually has a highly penetrant dorsal intercalation defect. Vang-1 mutants also give defects, and this is work by Yu Yun Zhu in the lab, and you can see here it's the same thing. We get um, contralateral uh, fighting and medial delay, and we also get ipsilateral co-migration, so intercalation defects that you've seen before. Yu Yun has gone on to show that Vang-1 is expressed at high levels in the dorsal epidermis. All this is promising, but that's all I can tell you right now. Right, the last thing I want to talk to you about actually capitalizes on an Andor product, the MicroPoint, which we actually had one of the original prototypes of this device many, many years ago, uh, which was originally built by Bob Nowak. And um, uh, a former graduate student, Ryan King, used a MicroPoint laser to look at the cellular requirements for dorsal intercalation. This is irrespective of any molecular pathways that we might identify. And, um, what we hope to do through these experiments is establish a set of cellular ground rules that could narrow the search for potential or molecular candidates. And I have to say these are mind-blowing but puzzling experiments. So uh, Ryan capitalized on the fact that worms have very stereotyped development. And so you can see uh, here what Ryan is doing, uh, based on the schematic on the left, is ablating various groups of cells using a micropoint laser. So a wild-type embryo is across the top. It undergoes intercalation, and some cells have been colorized in blue so that you can see them easily. You've seen that pattern before. Ryan asked, well, what happens if you get rid of the cells underneath the dorsal epidermal cells? So the cells in red or yellow, for example, that make um, muscle or um, make the intestine their endodermal cells. Well, Ryan did a number of heroic ablation experiments. So if he got rid of the intestinal tissue or um, group of muscle cells derived from a cell called MS that's in the middle, you can see that intercalation still occurs. And if you got rid of every single muscle cell precursor in the embryo, the same thing, intercalation nevertheless occurs. So non-epidermal cells don't seem to be particularly important for influencing what the dorsal cells are doing. That means that dorsal intercalation is mainly controlled locally within the epidermis. So Ryan did other ablations of epidermal cells. Here's one. The anterior cells colored in pink are derived from a cell in the early embryo called AB at the two cell stage. And a later cell called C um, gives rise to posterior dorsal cells colored in blue. So Ryan did an AB ablation so that the only cells that are left are um, the cells derived from C in the dorsal hypodermis, and he imaged that um, using confocal microscopy in a strain that's expressing a GFP tag junctional marker. That's what you see on the top. So you can see that at the end of this movie, there's a group of cells that sure look like they've undergone intercalation. These would be posterior dorsal cells in the absence of other epidermal cells. And uh, just to show you, here's a movie along the bottom showing you uh, an experiment like this. And you can see that the cells are protrusively active. Boy, they sure seem to be able to intercalate, and they undergo a movement of their nuclei that's characteristic of these cells. Conclusion from this kind of an experiment is that intercalation is controlled locally along the anterior-posterior axis and doesn't need the underlying cells. And uh, so whatever kinds of molecular cues we're going to consider, they have to be locally deployed, and um, I think we're excited to see where some of our current sets of experiments that I've told you about today are going to lead in that regard. All right, so it's time to summarize. 
Well, I hope I've convinced you that dorsal intercalation is a, a novel, great system for studying this kind of hybrid epithelial cell rearrangement, and that it's carried out by uh, RAC and Rho G mediated actin polymerization. It's also regulated by a novel trio caramel cassette. We're really working hard to understand how caramel might be influencing actin dynamics in that regard. SRGAP1 regulates polarization of dorsal cells and, and does appear to regulate um, perhaps membrane curvature during intercalation. I've also shown you that a CDC42 PAR complex pathway regulates polarization of dorsal cells and F signaling is probably upstream of this polarization. And then intriguingly, uh, at least I hope I've convinced you that it's intriguing. Um, there are probably other highly localized polarity cues in play. And we're really looking forward to deploying our new Andor based Dragonfly system to study some of this um, by using multimodal imaging and experimental perturbation in an integrated imaging package. Well, thanks for listening. I want to acknowledge the people who did this work. Um, I've already tried to talk about them along the way, but I want to particularly uh, acknowledge Joel Sear and Yuyun Zhu in the lab right now. Anna Hextad is picking up on the Carmel project. And uh, I want to acknowledge lab alums. Elise Walk Shannon did a lot of really fine work on Roe Family GTP ACEs. Um, Bethany and Ronan uh, did some work on SRGAP1. Um, Ryan King did the ablations that I mentioned, and then Paul Hyden and Williams Masson got this whole dorsal intercalation story started many, many years ago in the lab. I want to thank my funding sources, um, uh, a generous grant from the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, um, which funds my Raymond E. Keller professorship, um, and uh, the National Institutes of Health, and our collaborator, Dave Reiner. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jeff. That was a great talk. As someone who has um, done a little bit of polarity work in uh, cell polarity and tissue polarity in the past, that was super interesting. And the model is so beautiful. I'm impressed by how much you can see with those cells. Um, so we have a, a, a few questions. Um, and, and coming from this tissue polarity background of mine, um, it, can you talk a little bit more about um, you were mentioning that worms don't have a full planar uh, cell polarity pathway. Can you tell us more about that and what's known so far? Yeah, I'm happy to. So first of all, thanks for having me, Meredith. And um, this is uh, my first uh, all on virtual speaking engagement. So this is um, a new experience for me. Um, so uh, the main evidence that there's no full PCP pathway in worms comes from loss of function experiments. So if you take away certain things that are absolutely essential in fruit flies and in vertebrates um, that should be involved in helping cells to polarize themselves, um, you often get surprisingly mild phenotypes for most of them. Um, it seems that one of the things that worms have done is to substitute highly asymmetric and stereotyped cell divisions for some of the things that other organisms use PCP for. So the main thing you use it for is to, so that cells sort of know where they are in space. But if you're hardwired based on your genealogy, then you don't need that mechanism. And that's the argument that most people in the field make, I think. But having said that, um, you know, I think there is some evidence that at least some of the components are doing something similar to what they do in, in other organisms. Just the, the the full pathway that involves frizzles and flamingo and all these other mm -hmm. components that one might be familiar with from other systems, they just don't do very much in worms when you take them away. So that's, that's the main evidence. Um, having said that, it's a little bit hard because if you some of these things, if you remove their function, you just get a, a 
totally messed up embryo. So kind of the experiment's over. So it's not all the experiments have been done in a way that provides the kind of temporal specificity of, of loss of function that you would like. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for that. Um, keeping with the polarity theme, you were speaking about how CDC 42 promotes phylopodia, um, but we also know that it's it's intertwined in um, establishing cell polarity or in, involved in cell polarity events. So what do you think is going on here with those two functions and, and how it's at, what role it's playing in this specific uh, process? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure we have a complete answer to that. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of what we know. So um, CDC 42 associates with the PAR um, atypical protein kinase C, APKC complex, and that's where it's involved in polarity. And that can be front to back polarity of a single cell. It can be apico-basal polarity. It can be all kinds of epithelial kinds of polarity or neuronal polarity. But then CDC42, it's also clear it, it plays roles in stimulating the formation of particular kinds of actin networks is probably independent of that polarity function. It's hard to do clean experiments there sometimes. So let me tell you what we've done to try to address this. I showed some data on the PAR complex in the talk. So we do believe it's probably doing something to help polarize cells. It's not clear exactly what it's doing though, I will say, like the experiments that we've done so far fall short of kind of nailing exactly how it might be working with the PAR complex. What we know in terms of the actin piece is that um, if you make double mutants for loss of CDC42 function and loss of let's say RAC function or rho G function, you get synergistic effects on protrusion production, not just the orientation of the protrusions, but whether you make them at all. Um, and uh, so we think we think there probably is a function there in terms of stimulating part of the actin network that's, that's being produced as these cells are migrating. Um, and in particular, if you get rid of CDC42, then the, the little spiky protrusions that tend to coalesce or, or transform into more lamellopodial types of protrusions. Those are the things that are missing in CDC42 loss. So probably CDC42 is doing both things during this process. It's kind of hard to do super clean experiments to tease that apart. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so it was also really interesting to hear you talk about VAB1 and its role here as well. You, you gave us a little bit of a tease um, uh, saying that you were looking into what the ligand might be in, um, in this pathway. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that or which ones you're going to test and go after? Yeah. So the, the, the classical ligands for F receptors are called efferins, mm -hmm. and worms have several efferins. Um, another one of the VAB mutants called VAB2 is one of the efferins. There's another one called EFN4, efferin4. And um, uh, neither of those gives the same strong phenotypes that loss of VAB1 does. So normally, and, and then um, taking both of those out okay. together yeah. also doesn't do that. Mm. So that's if there's some other perhaps non-canonical ligand. So, so we looked at something which David Greenstein's lab at University of Minnesota has looked at in a completely different context. It's a protein called VPR1. And um, they looked at that. They showed during oenesis, oddly, that VAB1, the, the F receptor, and this other thing are probably a receptor ligand pair and they're somehow regulating ovulation. And so I don't think that has anything to do with our situation, but I will tell you that if you get rid of VPR1, you mess up dorsal intercalation for sure, but boy, the embryos are just, they look horrible. So we have to find cleaner temporal specific ways to remove the function of VPR1 in a temporal or tissue specific yeah. way than we've done thus far. And, it's possible, but we just haven't gotten around to those experiments. So it, my, my, if I'm going to put money on what we know so far, it's probably that VPR1 is doing something as a ligand. Um, it's not evident that there's any sort of spatial localization to VPR1 distribution at this stage. So 
Um, so we're not really sure how the whole VAB pathway leads to spatial asymmetries during intercalation, something we'd really like to know. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, and then we'll finish up with one last question. And um, we have, uh, we know that Prickle is, has been implicated in interacting with myosin. Um, can you tell us just a little bit more about that? Sure. So, yeah, John Wallingford's group in particular, working in Xenopus, has done a lot of nice work on convergent extension and the role of Prickle there. Um, and uh, they actually showed a slide that really talks about John's lab's work, although the slide was produced by somebody else. Um, by Cecilia Moens, but um, so what John's lab has shown is that, well, actually Ray Keller's lab originally showed that there are these really interesting, highly dynamic networks at, under the cortex involving actin and myosin in Xenopus cells that are undergoing convergent extension. And what John's lab has shown is that if you perturb prickle, you get strong perturbations in this network. So. Uh, and there's there's other evidence that that perhaps myosin physically associates with prickle, which is probably acting like a, an, a, some sort of adapter comp or nucleating a, a complex of proteins that's acting as an adapter protein. Um, so we've looked at non-muscle myosin in worms. It's actually really hard because the two non-muscle myosins that one has to look at are also required for cytokinesis in the early embryo. So you have to get around the early requirement during the cleavage stages. Um, and uh, so Elise did some preliminary experiments that are provocative, but I, I feel like we need to do some better experiments. So what she did was she made a, a mutant for um, non-muscle myosin 1, NMY1, and that protein is functionally redundant with another non-muscle myosin called NMY2. So she had a mutant for NMY1, and then she made a double mutant that contained that mutation, so it couldn't make that protein. And then it had carried a, a second mutation in the NMY2 gene, which is temperature sensitive. And then she did temperature shifts at around the time of intercalation. And you definitely get failure to complete intercalation. In fact, the back ends of the cells uh, look, like the cells look sort of triangular in shape. So the, the back ends never kind of squeeze Mm -hmm. It looks as if the cells are not getting squeezed into a more sort of rectangular shape. And so um, I don't know if Prickle relates to that. We will have to do a lot more experiments. We've looked at NMY2 GFP in a Prickle loss of function background. Nothing obvious leaps out at us, but that's also not a very definitive statement I just yeah. made. So, yeah, yeah, so we'll yeah. see. We want to look at that when we can get back in the lab. Yeah. Lots of things to do when you get back into the lab. Yeah. Um, so I think we're going to wrap up, but is there anything else that you'd like to say to the audience, Jeff? No, except uh, thanks so much for listening. Uh, it's been a privilege to be here. And I, you know, this is an and or event, but I have to say I am really excited about using that dragonfly. That's one of the first things we're really going to hit hard <laughs> when we get back in the lab. Well, I'm glad everyone is excited for it. I think we're all missing our microscopes right now. Um, I know I'm missing hearing about all the fun images uh, coming off of them. Uh, thank you again so much uh, for doing this with us and for giving a great talk. I It was really nice to see lots of pretty movies in there. Um, so thank you again, and thank you to everyone who's joined us today, and thank you to the Lab Roots crew for helping us out. Um, I hope everyone has a, uh, a great day and a great week. Take care. Thank you.